know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk is about Billy Bonney's legal testimonies exposing Santa Fe Ring criminals. Its information comes from my book, Billy the Kid's Writings, Words, and Wit. As I discuss in other talks, in that time frame, he also wrote letters seeking justice. Billy's testimonies prove he was a political zealot. In 1878, he risked ring arrest to come to Lincoln for a deposition to presidential investigator Frank Warner Angel about John Tunstall's murder. In 1879, for his pardon bargain with Governor Lew Wallace, he risked transport to a hanging trial to testify in Lincoln County's grand jury against the ring-eyed murderers of Houston Chapman. The next month was his own anti-ring agenda. He risked ring assassination to testify in the military court of inquiry against past Fort Stanton commander N.A.M. Dudley for intervening in the Lincoln County War battle. Billy's deposition of June 8, 1878 resulted from the Santa Fe Ring's biggest blunder. It was murdering John Tunstall, a British citizen. That forced investigation by President Rutherford B. Hayes to satisfy England's ambassador, Sir Edward Thornton. Alexander McSween had reported that the killing was done by U.S. officials. So in May of 1878, Two and a half months after Tunstall's murder, Investigator Angel was sent to New Mexico Territory. If ring-biased Hayes's motive was cover-up, as is likely, he picked the wrong man. Angel was diligent and honest. He deciphered the role of the ring in his several months' stay. He sympathized with the McSween side. He amassed evidence. He took 39 depositions. Billy's was one. By his deposition, 18-year-old Billy had endured ring and regulator confrontations. John Tunstall and Alexander McSween were falsely prosecuted. Tunstall was assassinated. He was illegally arrested by Sheriff William Brady. Tunstall murderers Frank Baker and William Buck Morton were killed fleeing arrest. Sheriff Brady and Deputy George Hindman were killed to stop their murdering McSween. Tunstall murder posse man Andrew Buckshot Roberts was killed resisting arrest. In that April's grand jury, he and other regulators were indicted for Brady's and Hindman's and Roberts' deaths. Added were Billy's losses. Tunstall, his first real father figure, was lost. Lost was the Penasco River Ranch Tunstall had gifted him. Lost was a life of peace. In 36 days, the Lincoln County War battle would erupt. Billy's 1,533-word deposition 
as his first recorded words. It showed his excellent recall and meticulous descriptions. It was legally witnessed by Auntie Ring, Justice of the Peace, John Squire Wilson. Wilson had already participated in Tunstall's coroner's jury report. He had written arrest warrants for Tunstall's killers. He had deputized Tunstall's employees, Billy and Fred Waite, under town constable Atanasio Martinez to serve the murderer's warrants. He had deputized Tunstall's foreman, Dick Brewer, to capture those murderers. But Wilson had been thwarted. Ring-eyed Governor S.B. Axtell shielded Tunstall's murderers by his illegal proclamation voiding Wilson's powers and outlawing Tunstall's deputized men. So justly angry, Wilson now heard and notarized the boy's deposition. By the next year, as covered in another talk, Wilson covertly helped Billy when New Hope came to Lincoln County in the form of new governor, Lou Wallace. Noteworthy also is Billy's hiding his grief and anger, which must have been intense that June 8th day as he recounted Tunstall's assassination. I'll read and comment on the excerpted deposition. Its entire transcript is in my book, Billy the Kid's Writings, Words, and Wit. On screen is the legal transcript of Billy Bonney's June 8, 1878 deposition to investigator Frank Warner Angel in Lincoln. I'll read selected portions, but I'll keep the deposition scrolling in silence through the skip parts for those who want to read them. It began. William H. Bonney was duly sworn. The Posen says that he is a resident of said Lincoln County, that on the 11th day of February, A.D. 1878, he, in company with Robert A. Wiedenman and Fred T. Waite, went to the ranch of J.H. Tunstall on the Rio Feliz, that he and said Fred Waite at the time intended to go to the Rio Penasco to take up a ranch for the purpose of farming. Note that Billy began his deposition with his proudest achievement. He anticipated having a ranch on the Penasco River in partnership with fellow Tunstall employee Fred Waite. It would have been under the Homestead Act. As a British citizen, John Tunstall did not qualify but he intended to give his employees ranches. Their confederation along the Penasco River would end the Rings Lincoln County economic stranglehold. And Billy knew that Tunstall was murdered for that dream. Billy continued that the cattle on the ranch of said J.H. Tunstall were throughout the county of Lincoln known to be the property of said Tunstall. Note that Billy addressed the ring's lie that Tunstall was in partnership with McSween to attach both their properties. It became the excuse to murder Tunstall. Billy continued that on the 13th of February, A.D. 1878, one J.B. Matthews, claiming to be deputy sheriff, came to the ranch of said J.H. Tunstall in company with Jesse Evans, Frank Baker, Tom Hill, and, first name left out, Rivers, known outlaws. Note that Billy's point was that the ring used outlaws as terrorist enforcers. Eventually, they would murder Tunstall. Billy continued, before the arrival of said J.B. Matthews, deputy sheriff, and his posse, Having been informed that said deputy sheriff and posse were going to round up all the cattle and drive them off and kill the persons at the ranch, the persons at the ranch cut portholes into the walls of the house and filled sacks with earth so that they, 
the persons at the ranch, should they be attacked or murder attempted, could defend themselves, this course being thought necessary as the sheriff's posse was composed of murderers, outlaws, and desperate characters, none of whom has any interest at stake in the county, nor being residents of said county. Note that Billy emphasizes both the danger and criminality of the ring's side. Billy continued, that said, Matthews, when within about 50 yards of the house, was called to stop in advance alone and state his business. That said, Matthews, after arriving at the ranch, said that he had come to attach the cattle and property of A.A. A. McSween. That said, Matthews was informed that A.A. A. McSween had no cattle or property there, but that if he had, he, said Matthews, could take it. That, said Matthews, said that he would go back to Lincoln to get new instructions. Note that Billy, aware of the fake partnership claim, again denies that Tunstall's cattle were McSween's. Matthews had failed to provoke hope for violence to justify killing so he needed new instructions from local ring boss, James Dolan. Billy continued, the persons at the ranch were R.M. Brewer, John Middleton, G. Gauss, M. Martz, R.A. Wiedemann, Henry Brown, F.T. Waite, William McCloskey, and this deponent. J.B. Matthews, after eating, started for Lincoln. Deponents started to Lincoln with Robert A. Wiedemann and F.T. Waite and arrived at Lincoln the same evening and again left Lincoln on the next day, February the 14th, in company with the above-named persons, having heard that said Matthews was going back to the ranch of said J.H. Tunstall with a large party of men to take the cattle and deponent and Wiedemann and Waite arrived at said ranch the same day. Deponent further says that on the night of the 17th of February, A.D. 1878, J.H. Tunstall arrived at the ranch and informed all the persons there that reliable information had reached him that J.B. Matthews was gathering a large party of outlaws and desperados as a posse, and the said posse was coming to the ranch to kill the persons at the ranch. Note that Billy established mortal risk from Sheriff Brady's posse. Billy continued, it was thereupon decided that all persons at the ranch, excepting G. Gauss, were to leave, and William McCloskey was that night sent to the Rio Penasco to inform the posse who were camped there that they could come over and round up the cattle. Note that Billy emphasized Tunstall's pacifism. It gives insight as to how Tunstall converted Billy from a violent delinquent to a rebel with a cause. Billy continued, Deponent left the ranch of said Tunstall in company with J.H. Tunstall, R.A. Wiedemann, R.M. Brewer, John Middleton, F.T. Wade. Said Tunstall, Wiedemann, Brewer, Middleton, and Deponent driving the loose horses. Wade took the road for Lincoln with the wagon, the rest of the party taking the trail with the horses. Deponent says that all the horses which he and party were driving, excepting three, had been released by Sheriff Brady at Lincoln, that one of these three horses belonged to R.M. Brewer and the other was traded by Brewer to Tunstall for one of the released horses. Note that Billy is establishing that the horses were immune to attachment. Billy continued, 
Deponent further says that when he and the party had traveled to within about three miles from the Rio Rio Doso, he and John Middleton were in drag in the rear of the balance of the party. And just upon reaching the brow of a hill, they saw a large party of men coming toward them from the rear at full speed, and that he and Middleton at once rode forward to inform the balance of the party of the fact Deponent had not more than barely reached Brewer and Wiedenman, who were some 200 or 300 yards to the left of the trail, when the attacking party cleared the brow of the hill and commenced firing at him, Wiedenman, and Brewer. Note Billy's meticulous observations, even in life-threatening events. A year later, this would yield his fatal testimony against ring-eyed commander N.A.M. Dudley in his court of inquiry for his treasonous Lincoln County War battle intervention. Billy continued, Deponent, Wiedenman, and Brewer rode over a hill towards another, which was covered with large rocks and trees in order to defend themselves and make a stand. But the attacking party, undoubtedly seeing Tunstall, left off pursuing deponent and the two with him and turned back to the canyo in which the trail was. Shortly afterwards, we heard two or three separate and distinct shots, and the remark was then made by Middleton that they, the attacking party, must have killed Tunstall. Middleton had in the meantime joined Deponent and Wiedenman and Brewer. Deponent then made the rest of his way to Lincoln in company with Robert A. Wiedenman, Brewer, Waite, and Middleton, stopping on the Rio Riodoso in order to get men to look for the body of J.H. Tunstall. Deponent further says that neither he nor any of the party fired off either rifle or pistol, and that neither he nor the parties with him fired a shot. Note that Billy emphasizes that Tunstall's murder was in cold blood. Billy signed as William H. Bonney. This is his first known signature. Hopeful Lincoln citizens, including Billy, had no way of knowing that attorney Frank Warner Angel's investigation was a sham. It's likely that Angel himself did not know until forced into a conclusion covering up the ring. In his report of October 4, 1878, Angel lied. He stated, after diligent inquiry and examination of a great number of witnesses, I report that the death of John H. Tunstall was not brought about through the lawless and corrupt conduct of United States officials in the territory of New Mexico. Billy Bonney's next legal testimony risked his life again. Again, it was against the Santa Fe Ring. It fulfilled his pardon bargain with Governor Lew Wallace he testified in April of 1879's Lincoln County Grand Jury against Houston Chapman's murderers, James Dolan, Billy Campbell, and Jesse Evans. And he got Dolan and Campbell indicted for first-degree murder and Jesse Evans for accessory to murder. The transcript is lost, a likely ring expurgation but Billy's testimony was confirmed in newspapers and by his attorney and friend, Ira Leonard. On May 10th, 1879, the Grand County Herald wrote, at the recent term of court in Lincoln, about 200 indictments were found, among them Colonel Dudley and George W. Pepin for burning McSween's house, Dolan and Campbell for the Chapman murder, in which the kid is the principal witness. On April 20th, 1879, attorney Ira Leonard reported to Governor Lew Wallace. 
he described testifying Billy's harassment by Ring Eye District Attorney William Reinerson. Leonard wrote, I tell you, Governor, the district attorney here is no friend to law enforcement. He is bent on going after the kid. He proposes to destroy his evidence and influence and is bent on pushing him to the wall. He is a Dolan man and is defending him in every manner possible. Billy's next testimony was the following month. He was still in his pardon bargains sham jailing. This time, it was for his own anti-ring agenda. He testified against past commander and A.M. Dudley in the May to July of 1879 Fort Stan Court of Inquiry for his possible court martial. The complaint was by Alexander McSween's widow, Susan, accusing Dudley of the Lincoln County War Battles murder of her husband, Alexander, and the arson of her home. Billy knew his risk. He had written to Governor Wallace two months earlier on March 20th, 1879, when his incarceration at Fort Stanton was possible for the pardon bargain. He wrote, all I am afraid of is that in the fort, we might be poisoned or killed through a window at night. Billy's testimony was devastating. When escaping the burning McSween house with others, he had seen three of Dudley's white soldiers fire at least one volley at them. Volley meant firing in unison. That meant under Dudley's orders. White meant officers. Billy also saw law intern Harvey Morris shot down. Possibly he was killed by them. Based on Billy's testimony alone, Dudley should have been court-martialed and even hanged for treasonously murdering citizens in violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. On May 28th and 29th of 1879, Billy was transported the nine miles from Lincoln to the Fort Stanton courtroom. The three judges were Colonel Galusha Pennypacker, Captain Henry Brinkerhoff, and Major Nathan Osborne. The prosecutor was Captain Henry Humphreys with co-counsel Ira Leonard. For the defense was Henry Waldo. The court was rigged. Chief Judge Penny Packer was Dudley's best friend from Fort Union. Waldo had been in ring boss T.B. Catron's law firm and Catron himself had represented reprobate Dudley for his past court-martials. Billy's two-day transcript reveals his precise mind and iron nerve. Brutal attorney Henry Waldo had just reduced testifying Susan McSween to utter confusion. He would humiliatingly destroy Lou Wallace's prosecution testimony too. Billy's questioning focused on Dudley's July 19, 1878 Lincoln County War Battle intervention. It was with his black cavalry, white infantry, white officers, a howitzer cannon, and a Gatling machine gun to aid ring-eyed Sheriff George Pepin, who was losing to the McSween side. Billy had been in the besieged and eventually burning house of Alexander McSween. Present, too, were other freedom fighters, McSween's wife Susan, her sister, and her sister's five young children. Noteworthy is that overwhelmed McSween relied on 18-year-old Billy to review his letters to and from Dudley. I'll comment on excerpts from the transcript the full transcript is in my book, Billy the Kid's Writings, Words, and Wit. One should be aware that attorney Ira Leonard, present throughout, saw Billy's brave testimony and became his loyal attorney. On screen is Billy from 1880, likely looking much the same as at his testimony. 
On May 28, 1879, his first day of testimony, he responded to the military prosecutor's questioning as follows. Question. What is your name and place of residence? Answer. My name is William Bonney. I reside in Lincoln. Question. Are you known or called Billy Kidd, spelled K-I-D-D, also Antrim? Answer, yes, sir. Note Billy's misunderstanding. He knew only his nicknames Kid and Kid Antrim. Question, where were you on the 19th day of July last, and what, if anything, did you see of the movements and actions of the troops in that city? State fully. Answer, I was in the McSween House in Lincoln, and I saw soldiers come from the post with Sheriff's Posse. That is, the Sheriff's Posse joined them a short distance below there, the McSween House. Soldiers passed on by, and the men dropped off and surrounded the house, the Sheriff's Party. Shortly after, the soldiers came back with Pepin, passed the house twice afterwards, Three soldiers came and stood in front of the house, in front of the windows. Mr. McSween wrote a note to the officer in charge asking what the soldiers were placed there for. He replied saying that they had business there, that if a shot was fired over his camp or at Pepin or at any of his men, that he had no objection to blowing up if he wanted his own house. I read the note myself. He handed it to me to read. I saw nothing further of the soldiers until night. I was in the back part of the house. When I escaped from the house, three soldiers fired at me from the Tunstall store, outside corner of the store. That's all I know in regards to it. Note the precision of Billy's testimony. The testimony continued. Question. Who escaped from the house with you and who was killed at the time, if you know, while attempting to make their escape? Answer, Jose Chavez escaped with me, Vincente Romero, Francisco Zamora, and McSween. Question, how many persons were killed in that fight that day, if you know, and who killed them, if you know? Answer, I seen five killed. I could not swear to who killed them. I seen some of them that fired. Who did you see that fired? Answer, Robert Beckwith, John Hurley, John Jones, those three soldiers. I don't know their names. Note that Billy was willing to say dangerous truth to bring down the Santa Fe ring. Question, did you see any person setting fire to the McSween house that day? If so, state who it was, if you know. Answer, I did. Jack Long, and there was another man I did not recognize. Henry Waldo then cross-examined Billy for the defense. Question, what were you and the others there with you doing in McSween's house that day? Answer, we came here with McSween. Question, did you know or had you not heard that the sheriff was endeavoring to arrest yourself and others there with you at the time? Answer, yes, sir. I had heard so, but I did not know. Note Billy's unintimidated retort. He had heard about the fake arrest warrants, but he knew no proof of their validity. Question. Then were you not engaged in resisting the sheriff at the time you were in the house? Prosecution objected as to irrelevance and was upheld. Question. In addition to the names you have given, are you also known as the kid? Answer. I've already answered that question. Yes, sir, I am, but not Billy Kidd that I know of. Note that Billy refers back to the earlier questioning and corrects his answer, stating that he is not known as Billy Kidd. Question, were you not and were not the parties with you in the McSween house on the 19th day of July last and the days immediately preceding engaged in firing at the sheriff's posse? 
Note that Waldo is trying to portray Billy as a lying outlaw. The court objected as to irrelevance. Question. Whose name was signed to the note received by McSween in reply to the one previously sent by him to Colonel Dudley? Answer. Signed N.A.M. Dudley did not say what rank. He received two notes. One had no name signed to it. Note again Billy's precise memory. Question. Are you as certain of everything else you have sworn to as you are to what you have sworn to in answer to the last preceding question? Answer, yes, sir. Note that Waldo could not phase Billy. Question, from which direction did Pepin come the first time the soldiers passed with him? Answer, passed up from the direction of where the soldiers camped the first time I saw him. Question, what direction did he come from the second time? Answer, from the direction of the hotel from the McSween house. Question, in what direction did you go upon your escape from the McSween house? Answer, ran towards the Tunstall store, was fired at, and there turned towards the river. Question, from what part of the McSween house did you make your escape? Answer, the northeast corner of the house. Question, how many soldiers fired at you? Answer, three. Question, how many soldiers were with Pepin when he passed the McSween house each time, as you say? Answer, three. Question, the soldiers appeared to go in company of threes that day, did they not? Answer, all that I ever saw appeared to be three in a crowd at a time after they passed the first time. Note that Billy cannot be shaken by Waldo. Question, who was killed first that day, Bob Beckworth or McSween Man? Answer, Harvey Morris, McSween Man, was killed first. Question, how far is the Tunstall building from the McSween house? Answer, I could not say how far. I never measured the distance. I should judge it to be 40 yards, between 30 and 40 yards. Note Billy's precision. He is willing to estimate distance, but denies formal measurement. Waldo can't rattle him. Question, how many shots did those soldiers fire that you say shot from the Tunstall building? Answer, I could not swear to that on account of firing on all sides. I could not hear. I seen them fire one volley. Note that this is Billy's precise and devastating answer. Billy even qualifies his counting shots by denying hearing, but by seeing the black powder puffs coming in unison from the soldier's rifle as a volley. Billy's observation should have led to Dudley's court-martial. Waldo knew this, and in his closing argument, he attacked Billy. This answer alone shows just how dangerous a gadfly Billy could be. Question. What did they fire at? Answer, myself and Jose Chavez. Question, did you not just now state an answer to the question, who killed Zamora, Romero, Morris, and McSween, that you did not know who killed them, but you saw back with John Jones and three soldiers fire at them? Answer, yes, sir, I did. Question, were these men, the McSween men, there with you when the volley was fired at you? and Chavez by the soldiers? Answer, just a short ways behind us. Question, were you looking back at them? Answer, no, sir. Question, how then do you know they were just behind you then, or that they were in range of the volley? Note that Waldo thinks he can trip Billy up. Answer, because there was a high fence behind and a good many guns to keep them there. I could hear them speak. Note that Billy is untouchable.
Question, how far were you from the soldiers when you saw them? Answer, I could not swear exactly, between 30 and 40 yards. Note that Waldo tried again, but Billy simply stuck to his original answer. Question, did you know either of the soldiers that were in front of the window of McSween's house that day? If so, give it. Answer, no, sir. I am not acquainted with them. Question, how do you know if you were making your escape at the time and the men Zamora, Morris, and McSween were behind you that they were killed at that time? Is it not true that you did not know of their death or the death of either of them until afterwards? Answer, I knew of the death of some of them. I did know of the death of one of them. I saw him lying down there. Note that Waldo fails to make Billy overstate. Question, did you see any of the men last mentioned killed? Yes, sir, I did. I seen Harvey Morris killed first. He was out in front of me. Question, did you not then a moment ago swear that he was among those who were behind you and Jose Chavez when you saw the soldiers deliver the volley? Answer, no, sir, I didn't think I did. I misunderstood the question, if I did. I said he was among them that was killed, not behind me. Billy is unflappable. The next day, May 29, 1879, Billy was questioned by the judges. Question, were the soldiers which you say fired at you as you escaped from the McSween house on the evening of July 19th last, colored or white? Answer, white troops. Note that white troops meant officers. That further confirmed that they were under orders of Dudley. That made him responsible. Question, was it light enough so you could distinctly see the soldiers when they fired? Answer, the house was burning, made it almost light as day for a short distance all around. Note that daylight visibility was key to Billy seeing shooting soldiers. This ended Billy's testimony. On the 49th and last day of Dudley's trial, on July 5th, 1879, Henry Waldo gave his closing argument. It began the Santa Fe Rings outlaw myth of Billy the Kid. That 19-year-old could have toppled the ring in a fair court. Waldo lied wildly to deny Billy seeing shooting soldiers. Here's Waldo's excerpted statement. It is complete in my book, Billy the Kid's Writings, Words and Wit. Waldo said, Then was brought forward William Bonney, alias Antrim, alias the Kid, a known criminal of the worst type, although hardly up to his majority, murderer by profession, as records of this court connect him with two atrocious murders, that of Roberts and the other of Sheriff Brady. Both of them are cowardly and atrocious assassinations. There were warrants enough for him to the 19th of July last to have plastered him from his head to his feet, yet he was engaged to do service as a witness and his testimony showed that his qualifications did not terminate with blood guiltiness. His testimony was brief, yet he signalized his opening sentences with a lie. He swears that members of the sheriff's posse fell in with the troops and came up to the McSween house. It has been proven by competent and unimpeachable witnesses that this statement is without any foundation in fact. Sheriff Pepin, his Deputy Sheriff Powell, Deputy Sheriff Marion Turner, Milo Pierce, Robert Ollinger, Joseph Nash, Andrew Boyle, J.B. Matthews, Lieutenant Goodwin, Captain Purrington, and Corporal Bugard, who brought up the rear of the column, all swear that none of the posse was anywhere near the troops. 
Note that these lying ringites were fighting the McSween's. Waldo continued, As to seeing the soldiers about the Tunstall building at the time of the escape of the men from the McSween house the evening of the 19th of July last, Kidd says that the soldiers stood at the outside corner of the building. Now, this story comes with its own reputation. In the first place, in the intense excitement of the moment, these men could not have had the coolness to select from a number of shots delivered at them the firing of certain particular shots to fix it in their minds, the men who did the firing. Besides, in the deceptive glare of the fire, it is very doubtful that any of the parties who were looking upon the space between those two houses could identify with any degree of certainty, particularly at such a time, the kind of clothes anybody wore. This difficulty would be enhanced in the case of the kid looking from the center of the light out against the darkness which is a circumstance of the greatest importance. While from the darkness to the wall, objects are plainly discernible, the direct opposite follows when the conditions are changed. Note that Waldo is desperately lying. He says escaping Billy was not cool enough to observe shooting soldiers. He absurdly lies that the fire could light the building but not shooting soldiers. He hides Billy's testimony that fire made it almost light as day for a short distance all around. Waldo continued, besides, it is clear the soldiers were not then present. The evidence of the sergeant who testified that late roll call for the night was at dusk or near as he can judge about a quarter past eight and that the men were then all there. Note that the escape was an hour later, ample time for the three soldiers to position for the shooting. Waldo continued, Besides, we must take into consideration that some of these men of the sheriff's posse were dressed with soldier jackets, to all probability, as they fled, they may have seen some of these men who had soldiers' jackets and thought they were soldiers. Note this absurd lie that Pepin's posse men dressed as soldiers. At 4.30 p.m. that same July 5th, 1879 day, Chief Judge Galusha Pennypacker Colonel Dudley's best friend delivered the three judges' decision. Penny Packer stated, in view of the evidence seduced, Colonel N.A.M. Dudley is not guilty of any violation of law or of orders, and his act of proceeding to the town of Lincoln was prompted by the most humane and worthy motives and by good military judgment under exceptional circumstances. Proceedings before a court-martial are therefore unnecessary. This corrupt decision sealed ring dominance in Lincoln County, and it fueled the ring's determination to exterminate the teenager, making a habit of giving devastating testimony against their members. On June 17, 1879, 19 days before Dudley's exoneration, Billy walked out of his sham pardon bargain jailing. Wallace had not issued the promised pardon, and the ring was about to transport him to Messiah for a hanging trial. As we shall see in talks about my book, The Lost Pardon of Billy the Kid, Billy still nursed hope for his pardon as he returned to gambling and gadfly rustling.